Today on Supernova, we see proof of exoplanets. We explore the hobby of astrophotography, and we discover one of the richest areas of the sky. Welcome to Supernova, I'm Eric Dunn. For centuries, astronomers have theorized about the existence of planets outside our own solar system. But until the 1990s, no discoveries of exoplanets could be verified. In 1992, a pair of radio astronomers announced they had discovered planets orbiting around a pulsar, and that result was quickly confirmed. Since then, more than 400 exoplanets have been detected. Christian Marwa and his team of astronomers have joined the search by surveying nearby young stars. The survey we did to look for other planets, we actually were aiming for nearby stars, stars that are really young. The main research for this is that young planets are really bright since they have a lot of energy from their formation and then they're just slowly cooling down with time. So aiming at young stars, you can catch a planet while they're still shining a lot of energy. HR 8799 was actually a very interesting star that was very high up in our target list. It's a star that's located in the constellation of Pegasus. It's a magnitude 6 star, barely visible by the naked eye. And the star is in the neighborhood of the sun. It's only 130 light years from us. To make these images possible, we had to go over several obstacles. First of all, we had to use what we call an adaptive optic system to be able to correct for the turbulence in the air that blurring our images. So we use a small mirror with small piston that changed this little mirror shape every thousand of a second. But even with that, uh, we have some limitation coming from the telescope itself and the instrument. The optics are imperfect and they produce noise. So we use a very careful observation strategy called the angular differential imaging technique where we can decouple the light of a planet then the light from an aberration coming from the telescope or instrument. To make the HR 8799 discovery, we use the uh, Altair adaptive optic system on the Gemini North Telescope with the NERI camera. This is an infrared digital camera essentially attached under the 8 meter telescope. But we make a roughly 150 10 to 20 second exposure on a star and then we process these images to be able to remove the starlight that prevent us from seeing the planet. And after that, after st stacking all the images together, we can see the, the light from the planet appearing on our screen. The three planets orbiting HR 8799 are in a configuration that are a bit different in our own solar system. First of all, the system is much bigger, it's roughly twice the size of our solar system. The closest planet orbit the star in roughly 100 years, and the furthest planet orbit in roughly 400 years. And also the planets are much more massive, they're roughly 7 to 10 times the mass of Jupiter. The discovery of, of, the, of these three planets really didn't happen like one shot and we saw all three planets. First of all, I saw using the Gemini telescope only the furthest of the three planets. And then after processing some kick that I realized it was not one object, it was actually two objects. And then we went back to the telescope, we tried to improve our, our imaging to improve the photometry the, that we were getting for these two objects. And after doing that, we realized it was not two objects, but actually three objects. So it's really something that was progressive and happened in a couple of months uh, that we saw that there was actually three objects in orbit around that star. Our survey is now split in two, so we spend a good fraction of our time acquiring new uh, stars to try to detect new planetary system that we want to be discovering. And also a good fraction of our time is also spent at trying to learn more about the HR-8799 system, trying to go closer in, see if there's a fourth planet, and also we're trying to do the spectroscopy now of these three planets, we try to derive a, a good spectrum and learn a lot more about the, the ongoing chemistry of these new class of objects. The discovery that we made that was, I think, a very a milestone uh, in terms of the search for exoplanet because it was, I believe, really one of the very good example that other planetary systems like ours exist in the Milky Way. And it, I think it's a very important step forward in terms of designing these future 30-meter telescope or space-based observatories to go much further in this search of the exoplanet field and try to push forward the instrumentation and go deeper and to detect less massive planets to go and try to, try to take images of Neptune-class planet or maybe Earth-like planet in the future.
One popular hobby for amateur astronomers is astrophotography. Chris von Druska and his imaging partner Aaron Amberson started by taking pictures of the night sky with a digital camera. Fast forward two years and they're now using an 8-inch telescope to produce some remarkable deep sky images. First uh, astrophoto that uh, we ever took was uh, a chance photo of Jupiter. Uh, we just got the basic uh, camera and the kit lens and we'd uh, gone up to the mountain and we, we saw a really bright point of light in the sky and we were just playing around with it. We took some pictures of it. Uh, we took it home and we looked on the computer at the picture and we noticed that uh, it was actually Jupiter. And uh, that sparked our interest in it. So we decided to go up again the next night and take some pictures of uh, some of the other things out there. We did some pictures of wide field sky, some constellations. We got some amazing detail and some amazing amount of stars that would come out when we would have just, you know, a little extra time shutter open for a little bit longer. Once we'd worked with the digital SLR for uh, a while, we wanted to get closer to some of the more distant objects. So that was where we decided we needed to get a telescope. The first telescope we bought for imaging was a 5-inch Max Sudoff Cassegrain. When we got that 5-inch telescope and attached it to the camera, we turned the camera to the moon and took some some exposures of the moon and we found some amazing details, craters we didn't even see before. Some of our best images came from taking pictures of the moon through the telescope. After we took pictures of the moon, we turned the camera to another point of light that was extremely bright in the, uh, in the setting sky and uh, it turned out to be Venus and we got some amazing crescent Venus shots. After we had taken pictures of uh, Venus, uh, we decided to point the telescope at some deep space objects. The longer focal length and the, the larger telescope gave us a lot more detail and got us a lot closer into the objects that we wanted to take pictures of. Using the digital SLR, you can take pictures of, of things like the open clusters or even some globular clusters that are bright enough so without having to do any kind of special manipulation of the images. You can get them straight out of the camera, print them out on your printer, and they give you some pretty amazing results. We didn't want to get overwhelmed with all the technical stuff when we, when we started doing this. We, uh, we just went with the camera. We just wanted to go out there to have fun and to bring some of the stuff that we were seeing out there back home and show some of our friends. It's like finding treasures in the sky. All throughout the year, there's new things out there. There's new things that you can bring home and, and show people who perhaps don't want to go out into the you know, cold of the night to, to sit there and look at those things. And to be able to bring those and, and you know, show them to friends and to family, it's really quite an amazing feeling. If you've got a digital SLR camera and uh, some patience and some curiosity, you've got what it takes to start taking some amazing pictures of the night sky. In frosty fall, when the dipper seeks the ground, the distinct W of Cassiopeia rises up. The lady in the chair offers an embarrassment of riches. Leader of Cassiopeia is Alpha, a fine orange giant. It's a wide and easy double with a ninth magnitude companion within the range of a small telescope. Eta is also a double star with a red dwarf companion. This is one of the simplest ways to spot a red dwarf without seeking the aid of charts. Phi is perched on the side of open cluster NGC 457. It is sometimes referred to as the ET cluster due to its resemblance to the movie character. One degree from delta is the open cluster M103. It forms a double string like a coat hanger and one orange member sits within. Another cluster is between the stars Sigma and Rho. The White Rose Cluster is so called because the loops of stars and dark lanes look like a swirling pattern of rose petals. From our latitudes, Cassiopeia is circumpolar, one of the constellations visible throughout the year. Because of the work being done by planet hunting astronomers with ever bigger telescopes and better instruments, we may soon find an exoplanet similar to Earth. 
If it's within the habitable zone of its sun, it may be capable of supporting life. For astrophotographers, their first picture of an object is an equally exciting discovery. The next time you go out observing, bring your digital camera and a tripod along with you and make your own discoveries. Thank you for watching Supernova. I'm Eric Dunn, wishing you clear skies.